We are very glad to host the second talk in this art lecture series here at Ode to Art, uh, conducted by Mr. Jeffrey Say, curator and lecturer at LaSalle College of the Arts. After our first uh, interesting talk about what is art and what is it for, Mr. Say will be giving us the requirements and basic criteria on this second lecture on the topic of how to look at a work of art and how to have a better understanding and appreciation of the art around us. We hope that after this talk, we'll be able to have a clearer eye for art and be able to put into words our feelings and thoughts about certain artworks. Our education very often taught us how to think in words and not in shapes, colours or forms. This departure from our established way of thinking is not an easy task and that is why this lecture aims to analyse and perhaps to teach us how to look and analyse and interpret in our own words a work of art to be able to understand and perhaps discuss about it. In the same way that good ear is necessary to understand music, good eyes and a keen interest are equally necessary to reach a full comprehension of feelings and ideas expressed through art. We hope that this talk will help all of us to improve on our observation skills and enable us to interpret directly and personally without any diluted verbal translation and to depend on our own eyes, minds and emotions. I hope that at the end of the talk, we will be able to read and create a direct relationship with this piece of art to perfect our interest in the subject matter. And we want to thank you, Mr. Jeffrey Say, once again for conducting this interesting topic and this talk. Okay, good. Okay, nice to see some familiar faces again and some not so familiar faces. That's fine, you know, it's always good to have a fresh audience as well. I mean, I've heard responses like, uh, you know, I like this work, right? I like this work, right? This work is fabulous, you know, this work is beautiful, right? But when you probe further and you ask that person, now why do you think this, why, why do you like this work? You know, I just like it, right? Um, you know, I mean, it's good to, um, I suppose, to, I mean, really, your, your response to work of art is normally based on gut feeling, intuition, instinct. Okay, that's fine. Okay, but I suppose a work of art is a product of, you know, an artist. Um, it's a whole process of, of the, the creative thought and feelings, okay, of, of what has, an artist has undergone. Okay, so what I was trying to say is that a work of art is a very complex um, piece of work, right, that I would say justify a more um, maybe complex response from us, okay, maybe complex is too strong a word to use, okay, but maybe a more uh, informed response, okay, from us. Now, if we look at this painting, the Mona Lisa, and, you know, we want to respond, it, respond to it, okay, um, you know, what is our first response to this painting? Now, it's um, said that when you look at a work of art, Okay, you respond, you respond first to its formal qualities. That's to say to the lines, the colors, the shapes, the texture. Okay? Rather than who is represented there in the work. Okay, I don't know how true is that. Okay, maybe it's true for some of you. Okay, when you look at a work of art, okay, the first thing you see are the colors and the shapes, etc. Okay, rather than you know what is represented in a painting. Okay? So, if we look at this work of art, if we're going to just respond to the formal qualities, right? Now, before going further, let me tell you what the formal qualities are, right? And what makes this uh, work so fascinating, okay? I think it's really to do with the techniques of Leonardo da Vinci, right? Because uh, he was an innovator in, uh, in many ways, right? And one of the, the techniques which he developed Okay, and which was to become very influential. Okay, it's what you call chiaroscuro. If you can look at the second word, okay, um, it's Italian for light, dark. Okay, meaning to say, um, you know, if you look at this painting, right, you can see that Leonardo used very pronounced contrast on light and dark. Okay, which gives the painting a three-dimensional effect or quality. Okay, now to, to, to uh, first start with formal analysis, looking deeper into formal analysis. Now, this is a, a very famous quote by Frank Steller. Okay, Frank Steller was, is a, is, he's still living, 
okay, he's um, a very famous uh, minimalist artist. Okay, now, I mean, minimalist artists are used, as the name suggests, you know, very minimal lines, colors, you know, etc. Okay, there's another minimalist artist called Robert Ryman who only creates white paintings, for example. Okay, that's why they are known as minimalists. Okay, and um, Frank Steller's uh, famous quote, okay, is what you see is what you see. Okay, a painting is just that. Okay, you can call it art for art's sake. Right, it's just, it's just that, okay, there are no sort of um, uh, moral stories to tell, no narrative, okay, no subject matter. Okay, but that's uh, Frank Steller's perspective. Okay, so, really, I mean, uh, you know, uh, formal analysis is really a, a explanation of the visual structure, of the ways in which the artist puts together um, you know, the visual elements of a work of art, like line, color, texture, etc. Right? Puts together, arranges them, right? Uh, either on a canvas or, you know, or even on a piece of sculpture. Okay? So, strictly speaking, okay, when you use a formal analysis, okay, subject matter is not considered, okay, nor the historical or political context of the work. Okay, but now this holds true for certain works. Okay, like this work, for example. Okay, it's a totally abstract work. Okay, now is it true that this work has no subject matter? Okay, or has no content? Okay, I'll come to that again later. Right. So this is this are an interesting thing to consider. Okay, so you know, I suppose you know when you look. May, perhaps this formal analysis is, is most relevant okay, when used to discuss abstract paintings. Right? Abstract paintings. Okay, which, um, and even still life. I mean, what can you say about a subject matter here? Oh, there are apples and oranges and, you know, and a compotier for holding you know, fruits. <laughs> okay? But I'm sure that, that you, know, you, you can talk a little bit more about this in terms of subject matter. Okay, but only what I'm trying to say is that you know the, the formal analysis of the work takes precedence, I suppose, over the subject matter for certain works of art. Okay, for certain works of art, particularly with contemporary art. But I'll talk. I'll be talking about that in my fourth lecture. Okay, how do you analyze you know contemporary work of art? Okay, which really you know aesthetics play no role at times in a contemporary work of art. Okay, I think I did show you last month, right? When I showed you Tracy Emin's bed, my bed. Oh, you see that it's a, a found object, a bait. Now, what can you say about that work? Okay, how can you do a formal analysis? Okay, or you can say, oh, that's, that's the bait and the bait sheet, you know. I mean, it's, it's tough, right? So, for those type of works, you, you perhaps have to use a different type of analysis, as I said, the thematic or the contextual analysis. Okay, and I mentioned that Tracy Emin's work is um, very autobiographical. Okay, so it's good to use a contextual analysis to look at her work. Tree. Okay, I will say first and foremost is now I'm going to compare these two. Well, one is one is one is what you can you can eat, right? Of course, you can't eat a Jackson Pollock's work, <laughs> right? But um, I'm trying to make a kind of uh, comparison between the two. Okay, so I think the first thing that they share in or they have in common is um, the presentation. Okay, although both have very different purposes. Okay, what they share is first and foremost the presentation, the overall presentation. Okay, so Pollock's work as well, right? Um, you know what you have is he pours paint on the different colors on the canvas. Okay, and he's concerned very much also with the overall presentation of the work. Right now we're going to look at next at the um, colors. Okay, the colors used. Okay, you can see that um, now going back to the pizza. Right. You can see that, you know, even for the, for the pizza, the chef, all right, now the chef is like an artist, I suppose, okay? What he's trying to create is a visually pleasing arrangement of diverse ingredients. So what you have here is red and green peppers, glossy olives, okay? Juicy mushrooms, right? Um, translucent onions, okay? 
all of that you know adds to the visual effect of the pizza okay right. and you know, I, I don't know whether you've come across you know, times when you order a pizza and all the olives are on one side you know right okay it makes you lose a bit of appetite right okay now likewise with Pollock's work now, if you can just trace one color with your eyes, okay, any color, it could be the green, the yellow, the black, okay, you can see that these colors occur as strategic points throughout the canvas. Okay, so in, a, in other words, there's no accumulation of one color okay, on one part of the canvas. Okay, all the colors occur as strategic points, okay, resulting in a kind of overall rhythm okay, of the work. And this is amazing. I mean, bearing the fact that I told you that Pollock just dances he, around the canvas, throwing flicking paint. Okay, so his technique is one that combines both control and chance. Okay, and he said that you know when, you know during that time when Pollock first produced his works, there were a lot of copycats. Okay, but no one was able to do, okay, like what Pollock did. Okay. Oh, okay, coming back to this, now let me go to, and then we compare the textures, okay, textures, um, now you'll see that the, the, you know, if you look at the pizza, right, it's stressed, uh, what you call, uh, there's a stress on irregular surfaces, okay, and the irregular surfaces are, um, of course, created by the, um, you know, the, the different ingredients, okay, like the crust, the cheese, Okay, and the diverse toppings. Okay, now likewise, Pollock's work use alternating thickness and thinness of the paint. Okay, so there's a combination of you know thick and thin paints, right? And you know, of, often also Pollock adds extra artistic materials onto his canvas. So you add objects like his cigarettes. You know, he likes to smoke. Okay, while he paints. Okay, so he will add that to his canvas, he will add things like glass onto his canvas. So that gives his, his canvas a rich texture, right, a rich texture. Okay, and also as you, you, if you notice, there's also an emphasis on um, curving forms, okay, or curved forms, okay. And for the pizza, the curved forms, okay, are achieved by, you know, the, the, the shape of the, the olives, right, the sliced olives, the mushroom caps. Okay, and in Pollock's work, it's achieved by the line, the, the curvature of the line. You know, as Pollock dances around, you know, the, the line sort of follow his the movement of his hand. Okay, right? Okay, as he throws and, and, and flicks the paint onto the canvas, as he moves around the canvas. Okay, so that's just a very brief comparison of a pizza and a painting. Okay. So I hope that gives you a good idea of you know, um, you know what what uh, formal analysis mean okay um, now the theme as I mentioned has to do with the subject matter okay the meaning of a work right as well as the content okay and um, historians and scholars they have developed um, you know different ways of looking at the meaning of a painting okay and one of these ways is what they call iconography Okay, and it was, this is a technique developed by an art historian, a German art historian called Erwin Panofsky, right? And it's a branch of art history which deals with studies, the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images. Okay, and this is in uh, Panofsky's own words, right? Okay, it's the branch of the history of art which concerns itself with the subject matter or meaning of works of art as opposed to form. Now, can you see that? Okay, so Erwin Panofsky's, um, he has taken another position. Okay, he's looking more now at the subject matter, the meaning of a work of art, rather than the formal quality. Anofini, now it used to be called the Anofini wedding, right? But I think the, uh, the gallery wanted to take a more um, uh, neutral stance, right? Because it's not proven that this is actually a wedding. Okay, so they name it the Anofini double portrait, right? Okay, now, um, now this work is subject to much speculation. Okay, and that's what makes it uh, quite interesting as well. Okay, and um, 
it was Panofsky's interpretation of this painting, okay, that, um, you know, it's still very much, um, in a way, seen, seen as the, the accepted version, but many other people have come up with their own versions, okay? So when Panofsky looked at this painting, all right, okay, now, in terms of subject matter, the, now, when we look at it, we just look at, you know, there is taking place in a kind of, I don't know, a bedroom, perhaps, okay, or, or a hall, okay, of a home, okay, you have a couple there, they're holding hands, okay, they are, they are dressed uh, in, in rather opulent clothing, okay, and they are quite expensive objects all around, the chandelier, the mirror, etc. Okay, but Panofsky wanted to find out more, what are the symbolic meanings of all these you know, the objects and even the gestures of the couple. Okay, what's what's the whole meaning of all this? Okay. So of course to do that he has to do some research, right? Okay, he has to do some research. He has to plow through documents, he has to look at other paintings, okay, other similar paintings. Okay. And he came to this conclusion that what is taking place here is a wedding. Okay, it's a marriage. Now he even went further. Even went further. He said that this painting itself is, you know, like your ROM, huh? if you go to Registry of Marriages. Okay, if you register, you get a certificate. So according to Panofsky, this is a wedding certificate, the painting itself. Okay? And to support his argument, okay, he pointed out to a few clues in this painting. Can you see this signature here at the back? He says, Jan van Eyck was here. Now, Jan van Eyck was the Flemish painter, okay, who did this painting. Okay, so apparently the artist was present. Okay, Jan van Eyck was here. And can you see the mirror at the back? Okay. Now, in the mirror, you can see two other people. Okay, two other people. Right? And according to Panofsky, he argued that these two people were witnesses to a marriage. So he needed two people to be witnesses, okay, to a marriage. And their formal hand gestures, okay, according to Panofsky again, okay, those hand gestures signify that, okay, a wedding, right, a marriage is taking place. Okay, a, a kind of a vow, okay, was being done here. Okay, of course, Panofsky's position has been challenged now, okay, by many people who say that, well, there are documents that prove that, you know, during this date, okay, when, when the painting was done, okay, there was, there's no evidence that, you know, that they were married, okay. Now, to further support his claim, right, Panofsky looked at the various objects, right, in this painting. Okay, he looked at the dog. Can you see the dog? Is it a terrier bit, right? It's like a terrier. All right, and then, okay, if you look at the dog, Right? The chandelier, the oranges on the windowsill, and on the chest. Okay? Now, if you look at the, you know, the fact that if you look at their footwear, okay, or what you call their patterns, okay, you see that you know, they have taken off their footwear. Again, according to Panofsky, because they are actually standing on holy ground. This is a sacred marriage. Okay? They are standing on holy ground. Okay? Now, the chandelier has a single lighted candle. Okay, and according to Panofsky, it symbolizes the, um, it could be the divine presence of God, okay, or the all-seeing eye of God, okay, the single lighted candle, okay. And there are also clues that point to fertility, the concern with, you know, childbearing, which is a biblical sort of uh, injunction, you know, right, okay. Um, oh, by the way, before that, okay, if you look at the, now these two, this couple here, um, they are what do you call the, the Giovanna and Giovanni Amofini. Okay, they were originally from Italy. Okay, then they settled in Bruges in uh, in Belgium. Okay, they were wealthy. Um, he was a wealthy merchant. Okay, and um, if you look at Giova Giovanna's, um, uh, is she really pregnant? You think? Right. Are you sure? She looks pregnant to me. Okay, now, of course, you know, at that time, right, it would have been taboo, you know, right? 
okay, if you were to be married before, uh, you know, you were pregnant before you were married. So of course, you know, here is only symbolic. Okay, she holds up the excesses of a, of a gown, okay, to, in a sense, simulate pregnancy, okay, to show that they'll, she'll soon be able to bear children. Okay, and there are other clues that, um, you know, uh, suggest fertility here. The oranges, okay, the oranges symbolizes what we call natural abundance, okay, fertility. And there's also a, a, a statue at the back of the chair, all right, um, we show St. Margaret, who is the patron of childbirth. Okay, so all, there are all these clues. Okay, and also the, if you look at the mirror, okay, now the mirror has some decorative motifs showing the passion of the cross or the stations of the cross. Okay, so you see all this religious symbolism in the painting. Okay, that led Panofsky to conclude that this is actually a sacred wedding taking place. Right? Now I'll return to this uh, this painting again, okay? But that's Panofsky's interpretation. Oh, and the dog. You're wondering about the dog, okay? And according to Panofsky, okay, um, one of the dog's traditional symbolism is of fidelity, faithfulness to marriage. Okay, so the dog actually symbolizes, okay, fidelity. So you can see how you know an interpretation can add or can make any a, a painting a work of art. Okay, more interesting. Okay, lastly, um, <clears throat> somewhere closer to home. Okay, if you come across this, this picture, very famous picture, right? It was hung in the um, the Singapore Museum, right, a few years back, but they have taken it down. I think it'll be shown at a newly uh, open museum, right, in 2015, the National Art Gallery. Okay, Chua Mia Thi's, um, National Language Class. It's one of um, uh, our masterpieces. Okay. Now, this painting was uh, done in 1959. Okay. Now, anyone recall what happened in 1959? Singapore gained, oh, don't know your history, right? Okay, never mind. Okay. Singapore gained self independence. Hey, sorry, is it Singapore? Is it Malaysia? Oh, self government, yeah, correct. Okay. Maybe I don't know my history. Self government. So it was a, a very important year, okay? And you know, in order to, to um, you know, further analyze this painting in terms of its political, okay, um, sort of context, okay, we have to know who the artist is. Okay, Chua Mia Ti, he belonged to a society known as the Equator, Equator Art Society, okay? And the Equator Art Society was a, a society of artists which, um, you know, uh, which have left-wing sentiments, Okay, they sympathized with the, the communists. Okay, and as you know, at that time, the communists were you know, um, staging a lot of strikes and rallies right, against the colonial government. Okay, right? so, and, and members of the Equator Society normally depict uh, very ordinary working class people in their works. Right? They were the ones who really uh, specialized in what they call woodblock print. Okay, woodblock print. Okay. Now, in this painting, again, if you look at it on the surface, it looks like an ordinary class taking place, right? Okay, you see the teacher there and the students. Okay, but look closer. Okay, on the board, okay, it's written, okay, Malay phrases. Okay, roughly translated to what is your name and where do you live? Now. I mean, in language class, you know, it's, it's harmless, right? I mean, those are very prosaic phrases that we use. Okay, what, what, what is your name and where do you live? Okay, you learn your language that way. But if you want to, to put the painting in a bigger context, you can interpret those phrases as something to do with national identity. Right? Okay, because at that time, you know, Singapore still aspire to, um, you know, to, to be independent. Okay? And the Equator Society was very anti-colonialist, very nationalist in its aims. Right? So remember the subtext that I told you, we can read the subtext in that way. Okay? That these phrases are more political than you think. Okay? And look at the students there, right? the students. Look at the clothes that they are wearing. Look at their ethnicity and their races. And what do you notice? 
Oh, they are comprised different ethnic groups. Okay. I mean, and they also comprise different, um, what do you call, uh, classes, I, I believe, right? You can see the woman dressed in, is that Chongsa? Okay. Dressed in a very elegant Chongsa. Okay, while, while others are dressed in, a, you know, in very simple clothing. Right? Okay, so you can see, you know, people from all walks of life coming together to learn a common language. And I believe that 1959 was also the year when Malay was declared, okay, as a kind of a national language. Okay? So this whole painting was meant to assert the kind of national dignity and national identity, right, of, of Singapore as a nation. I mean, there are other, there are, there are other sort of um, readings as well. The round table also signifies equality, okay, rather than a square or rectangular table. Right? So it blends in with the, the kind of Marxist or communist um, ideology of bringing different classes, races, okay, um, genders together in a kind of communitarian society. Right? Perhaps as a collector, it's always good. I mean, again, as I mentioned in my, at the start of my talk, you know, instinct, intuition play, play a role, right? But it's always, always good to know more about the artist and, and you have to research more. Not only about the artist, but the work of art, right, as well. Okay. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, then uh, may I request for another round of applause for Mr. Jackie Stray. Okay. And of course, to all of you for uh, here's another round of applause for everyone.